Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 58 of the Stomp the Bus show. I'm your host, Mark Harris, alongside Colton Dodgson, and our first recurring guest, or our only recurring guest so far, Ralph Amston, live from North Carolina. Ralph, how's it going? It's going well. I didn't realize I had the honor of being a recurring guest. That's incredible. I was going <laughs> to ask you how it feels. That's got to be like a massive achievement for you, right? It feels good. No, it makes me happy. I... I <laughs> I, uh, uh, it, it's one thing to be invited on. It's a completely different thing to be invited back. I, I, I enjoy that very much. So thanks for having me guys. You, yeah, we've had four shows total that have had a guest. So you've, you've occupied half of them. <laughs> nice. Most of that is just due to me being lazy and forgetting to invite people, but Hey, whatever, uh, anything to get a good show going. So, uh, as we all know, ASU is one in five on the bye. They face a very difficult schedule the rest of the way. Uh, but after a pretty unimpressive non-conference due to all sorts of reasons, they've looked competent um, in their last three games, sometimes mm-hmm. kind of frustratingly competent in how close their last two losses have been. What's kind of stood out with how this team has kind of evolved as the year has gone along? Um, I think that they're well coached because they are not uh, very healthy, nor are they very talented at this point, like not comparatively, you know, these are still D one athletes. They belong. Um, Yeah. But the, they've been relatively competitive with USC, with Colorado uh, at, at points with, with Oklahoma state, they can compete. um, They just aren't finishing uh, the, the job in, in some of these games and it's understandable. Um, you know, anybody can use injury as a crutch, but it's been a lot of injuries. It's a legitimate Um, crutch. It's a legit. It's been a lot of injuries. I don't know. Adjusting expectations was probably the most important thing coming into this season. And I'm not sure how many fans made that adjustment on their dial. So I'm seeing a lot of people uh, be as miserable as ever. And at the same time, it's like, well, you have the option to not be because they took right. the opportunity for a bowl game away. So this whole season is an exhibition whole seasons, preseason. It doesn't uh, like taking anything from this season uh, personally, you can take it seriously, but taking it personally, it just, I, I, I don't understand the, the logic behind that. Nothing that happens this year matters for this year so you don't have to be mad this right. year you get the snooze button on your emotions and just go yeah. about your life it's kind of nice that's a good analogy the snooze button i i think every week since usc so i guess the last two weeks we've we've kind of gone through me and mark and looked at the schedule and we we've always had the discussion of like which remaining games because Neither of us, even at our most pessimi- pessimistic, were like, yeah, this is a one-win team. I don't think either of us thought it was like a seven-win team, but I think we aligned somewhere on like three to four wins. Um, but in terms of like the expectations and that doom and gloom that some fans are, are feeling, um, I, I think ASU just lost their two most winnable games remaining on this schedule. What do you kind of think about that? Are Like looking ahead, where is it? Where do they get any additional wins in terms of like what should we fans expect with with the remaining schedule? Oh, I think UCLA is in a situation with a freshman quarterback that almost anything they do is a coin flip. And I'm talking about playing against the toughest teams in the conference, which they don't, by the way. If UCLA beats Oregon State this weekend, they might go 11 and one because they miss Washington and Oregon. They don't play either team. So, uh, you know, and but they have a freshman quarterback. They have a first time defensive coordinator who is doing a fantastic job, but it is his first time. He hasn't seen everything that there is that he's going to see. So that's a possibility. Utah can't score. They cannot score. If you can score 17 points against Utah, you can probably win the game. Yeah. So, Ralph, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to cut you just. 
I was going to bring this up in in terms of, oh, what is the game that we can win? And yeah. it's, it feels so sacrilegious in my head to be like, oh, we can go to Utah and win. But it's like, well, they score like seven points a game. Yeah. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that Baylor game. I mean, I'm like, yeah. And it doesn't look like Cam Rising is going to be back either. So and nor should he be now that so. we know what his injury is. Now that we know he's nine months out from four different torn ligaments in his knee. Um, why are we even having this conversation? It is the shut it down, yeah. shut it down, apply for a medical red shirt or move on. He's done enough to get a shot probably as an undrafted free agent um, at the NFL level. But I, from, I, I remember, he, I think he missed his senior year of high school and then he tore another ACL at Texas. I think this is his third ACL. So, you know, it, the the whole game that they've been playing that's a whole nother story but like that uh, that being said they don't have a lot of talent at the running back position we don't know if they're talented at receiver because they can't get any receivers the ball yeah. and their tight ends are banged up so whereas utah is still a very dangerous team in the trenches and on defense they can't score so find a way to get you know two touchdowns and a field goal you might win that game um you you might win the ucla game just because they they carry with them the unpredictability of starting a freshman quarterback who didn't even look that good against Washington state, Washington state just choked that game away. I don't think they beat Washington state, to be honest. I just watched Washington state play the worst game ever. Uh, so maybe you get a little bit of a home field advantage, assuming fans continue to show up to Sun Devil stadium. That'll be very important. And we and really Washington state too. It's not like some marquee, you know? So Yeah. Is that, yeah, but I would remind fans we owe ASU one. We do. Oh, I yeah. Because we booed our own players in Jake Dickert's first game in 2021 because of the way that they were playing against Washington State. We owe it to the players to show up and support this iteration, this coaching oh, staff. Oh, for sure. For sure. So I, I hopefully, agree that. hopefully yeah. they gain some type of home field advantage. Otherwise, that's going to be a really tough game to win. So I give him maybe a 20% chance at Washington State, maybe 45 to 50 UCLA, 30 to 40 at Utah. It's possible. It's possible that they can eke a, a couple out here and there. But you're right. The easiest part of the schedule is behind them for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously that U of A game too. Those are always – you don't know what's going to happen in those games. U of yeah. A looks solid. But, we, I mean, we've had four different leading passers uh, – on offense this year it's we talked about injuries and and quarterback injuries have just been brutal this year um but yeah I I know now Borgay has kind of taken over due to due to the circumstances with Rashada and everything else we talked about Borgay a ton when you were on last time uh it it seems like he just keeps finding these opportunities and, and taking advantage of them when he's there how what have you seen out of him this season how do you feel about him uh you know, his shortcomings are obvious. Um, if a defensive lineman gets their hand on him, he's going to go down. He's mm-hmm. uh, built like a regular human being, not necessarily <laughs> like college football Adonis athletes that, you know, m- that we're used to seeing. Um, so if you get a hand on him, he's probably going to go down. But his processing power, his – his uh, cerebral ability as a quarterback understanding the offense understanding where he needs to get the ball like he's doing a lot of this by just being the smartest guy in the room you know i'm seeing a lot of people call for his head like there is no one to replace so dick what are you going to do if you bench him what are you going to do with this conover yeah or maybe, maybe, but maybe but then conover won't doesn't even have a backup it's the whole exactly. thing so you know i would say that Jaden Daniels last 300 yard passing game as an Arizona state Sun Devil happened at the end of his freshman year. I think Trenton has like five or six, 300 yard passing games in like his eight last two. Starts. Yeah. Yeah. He, he can move the ball. Yeah. Yes. You know, do they trust yes. him in goal line situations? Doesn't seem to be the case because they keep bringing in the wildcat. Uh, do you know, is he is he going to escape the pass rush as well as uh, other options? Not that we have other options, but other options you might have at quarterback. Had everyone been healthy? Not necessarily. Um, but he know he knows where to go with the football. 
I, he's not costing us games. Like right, there no, seems to no. be this yeah. this idea that oh, only if if only Trent played better, um, right? And that's not you know what would you mean if he played better with five of the top offense uh, eight offensive linemen out? That's probably not going to happen. It is a it is unbelievable that Arizona State has had any success moving the ball with no ability to run it yeah. and with you know with people with freshmen starting on, on the offensive line freshmen yeah right and no, i mean like, he tied the he tied up that that colorado game there at the end it was that deep ball that that broke ASU's back a little bit but i mean i agree with you it's it's not like he he hasn't lost us games i think that's the best way to put it and Mark, what it, were you going to say? I'm sorry. Well, and Ralph, you mentioned just the offensive line injuries. It's just, I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen anything like this for either like a college team or a pro team where it's not this, not that they're injured, that they're like top five guys are all injured. Yeah. And both tackles. Like I was thinking the other day, like if ASU, like I wonder what ASU's record would be if just one of Emmett Bully or Isaiah Glass was still healthy. Like, if only one of like, not even asking for both of them to be healthy, like maybe it only needs one more win, but it's like, yeah. And I mean, you mentioned Borgay, like he's, he's still pretty nimble in the pocket too. Like I was impressed with his rushing ability, taking the lanes that were there against Colorado. Yeah. Uh, he has awareness for sure. He yeah. has awareness. It's if they get to him, that's right. Yeah. right. You know, he's not, he's not sh- shedding any tacklers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's uh, what so where were you like in, in the aftermath of the Fresno State loss? Like, what were your thoughts about this team then? And then how have they kind of changed now? Uh, yeah, the Fresno State, uh, Fre- Fresno State, I'm not really ever seen anything like that um, because Arizona State was uh, they were really on Mikey Keene's ass, weren't they? Like they they, they were uh, doing the cornerback blitz, uh, got him a couple of times on that. BJ Green was all over Mikey Keene. He's been um, incredible this year. He really has. He really has. Um, it, it it's not often that you get somebody who comes in as a walk on and you're like, oh, this guy's really good. He could exceed expectations, and then he exceeds expectations, and then you're like, oh, this guy might actually be our best defensive lineman. He, yeah, you know, but he's going to be the focus, so they'll probably take that away. They haven't. Like he he is uh, he he uh, delivers no matter what. And that's been awesome. Um, But the defense was all over Fresno State, gave them eight extra possessions. And with all their possessions and and another eight, they scored 29 points. Yeah, it is the worst game probably in like ASU history, while also being like one of the best defensive performances I've ever seen. So I (laughs) that that was a bitter that was a bitter pill. Uh, bitter necessary pill, I suppose. But um, the the change in play calling was pretty fascinating to me because I think y- you had a lot of people criticize Kenny Dillingham and say, well, duh, like you're the innovative young play caller. How do you think you got this job in the first place? Shouldn't you be handling all this? And I thought he actually made the mature decision to play the role of head coach and not try to do too much. Um, but you know, the results have been night and day and some of the stuff that Kenny Dillingham is doing out there is ludicrous street football, draw up plays in the dirt type stuff. Like the, the, the motions and the formations and the changes, uh, when they're in goal line offense, it's all just, I mean, you can't tell me you're not laughing out loud that some of this stuff that they're doing is working. Yeah. Um, and in the USC game, it was just like a clinic in, in like uh, backyard football. And uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. And and that part, it's weird because I, I felt, I felt very protective of the choice Kenny Dillingham made. And I was pushing back against a lot of the people saying that he needed to take over play calling. But now that he has, <laughs> why wasn't he doing that all along? <laughs> yeah, 100 percent. I love watching what how he uses Scadaboo. That's been yeah. from the USC game on just like, is there a coach that loves having a player 
more than Kenny Dillingham loves having Cam Scadaboo. Like he uses that dude in so many different ways. It's been so fun to watch. Absolutely. He's probably at this point one of the top three passers on the team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, probably the top runner, definitely the top punter. Um, and uh, as we saw after the Colorado game, he can tackle as well. Yeah, just a positionless <laughs> a positionless football player. It's incredible. Oh, man, if Steve Kime had a job, he'd be drooling all over the yeah, idea of, there you of, go. of drafting a Swiss Army Knife player. He'd be drooling <laughs> in his uh, car that he definitely didn't drive home drunk from. All right, all right. That's the only Steve Kime. <laughs> um, Ralph, you mentioned the punting. I... I am so glad we got the we tried out the new punter this last week against Colorado because what happened against Cal? I mean, look, I you have to be not good at punting to for people to just be it's so noticeable. Like right. That, it's, like that cost us the Cal game. It's crazy to say that, but I like just watching the game, it's just I know it's such a small detail, but it's I, I, yeah, just when you bring that up that yeah. Yeah, following the Cal game, I listened to a couple of podcasts and they were they were pretty critical of Josh Carlson. Um, turns out he has broken bones in his foot. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it bummed me out a little bit that he put it out that that he had to put like the doctor's note out there because um, I think he was probably feeling the feel, feeling the pressure um, hearing what people were saying about him. Uh, apparently, this happened before the season. And he tried to play through it, and yeah, that's not going to work. That's not it's like trying to yeah. throw with a broken hand. Uh, not, yeah. not not gonna happen. So uh, I would think the, punters need their feet. <laughs> yeah. So they <laughs> needed to make the change, and they did. And it, you know, it's been it's been better. I just feel bad for him that he that he felt enough pressure to have to because he could have just said like I'm hurt, you know. But right. to but to actually put the 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 diagnosis out there, the doctor's note. Um, um I, hopefully people cut him some slack now. Yeah, that that does change the equation, obviously. Um, yeah, cause it's like, yeah, like throwing and, um, yeah, it's, uh, what's interesting to me is just how, just the pressure that we've been able to get on quarterbacks, you know, mm. I mean, I'm looking at team stats, collegefootballstats.com team rankings, ASU's 3.6 sacks per game are tied for 10th in the country, which I didn't, yeah, that's I mean, I knew that like we had been putting pressure on the quarterback, but that's way like that's impressive. Very, especially after last year when the, I don't know if it was by design or or what, if we were mostly just trying to contain play run defense. I think they they kind of tried to allude to that. Um, it's not I, I don't understand enough to have followed along with the idea that not hitting the quarterback could be your intent. Um, but this year for, I mean, for it to change that much and yeah, we got some pass rush specialists through the portal, um, who, who need to develop to be more well-rounded right. football players, um, if they want to be on the field all the time, but they're very good at getting the quarterback. So, you know, we, we, we got quite a few of those and our defensive line, you know, despite injuries, our linebacking core, despite injuries, I think is overperforming at this point. Um, the coaches that they have working on the defensive side of the ball, whether it's Vince Amy or AJ Cooper, like these are guys I really, really like I trust. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the defense really, really looks good. Uh, you can point to, you can look at Roe Torrance's busted coverage against Colorado and, you know, get upset at him. But then it's like, where, but where would we be without him? Right. This year, yeah. you know, you look at what they they're getting out of D Ford. Uh, incredible. You look at the fact that Jordan Clark is, you know, playing his heart out every game injured yep. um, is, is wild to me. Um, and they're very, very thin at linebacker and they, they're not super deep on the defensive line either. It just seems like they're getting the most out of everybody. And that's been really cool to watch. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is when you're having a season like this where, you know, I mean, at this point, probably the best case scenario is three and nine. Um, and I, you know, I would sign up for two and 10 right now. I mean, I, like you, I, obviously it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but I just don't want to go one and 11. I'm a fan. You know? uh, yeah. And when you look at this team, we just like, there's a lot of 
players that are just performing well. You know, Elijah Badger's been awesome. And mm-hmm. Scadabo, we mentioned, it's just like, we just need a few games to just come together. But it, but that's the thing that's encouraging to me is like, okay, like you are seeing like individual success throughout this team. Yes. And there is, I mean, you never know with the transfer portal. You just don't. Right. But you, you look at some of the possibilities for next season, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, a healthy Jaden Rashada, potentially a healthy Trenton Bourget, um, maybe getting some help in at running back, adding Jordan Tyson and Jake Smith to the receiver room. Right. Because they're both not healthy, um, but could potentially be, you know, two of the top 10 receivers in the conference if fully healthy. Um you know, they're they're getting production out of the tight end position, which I think will help in recruiting the tight end position, but they'll need a little help there. Uh, and on almost all of these offensive linemen outside of Joey Ramos will be back, I think. And uh, I'm assuming Ben Coleman might maybe get a get a waiver for for yeah. this year. So, you know, you, you look ahead to next year, you see some of the pieces that are in place and you realize, oh, like th- this offense could be very solid. Next year, you know, I would say top half of the the pack, but the pack won't exist. So um, I think it'll, it'll it'll at least be enough to put some points on the board against some of these big 12 teams. Right. Right. Um, and. Yeah, it's weird. And, and that's why, like, I think so many people's predictions about ASU heading into the season in just terms of a record were wrong. But part of it's just because this is like the best pack 12. Like we all predicted ASU you know, would go, you know, whatever, five and seven or six and mm-hmm. six based on previous versions of the Pac-12. Right. And then it's like, oh, nope. And that's half the, like, eight teams are ranked and also you don't play Stanford. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, eight teams, eight teams uh, have been ranked at some right. point. Uh, Washington State, uh, outside of their game against UCLA, has looked phenomenal. Um you know, I think Washington is underranked. I think Oregon is underranked. Um, you know, I that think that game is going to be insane. I'm yes, so it is. Insane. Yes, it is. I think USC is playing with fire, but I think they have the best offense in the country. Right. Yeah. Um, you just can't expect your offense to be performing at a at an A plus level constantly. That can't happen. So they're going to have to figure something else out. But, I mean, the hire that UCLA made at defensive coordinator is insane to me. They hired a guy named DeAnton Lynn, never called the defense before. He's a safeties coach in Baltimore. And uh, they paid him 200000 more than any coordinator has ever made at UCLA. Wow. And I, th- I thought it was such a wild hire, but then you watch the way that UCLA is playing defense. It might be the best hire anybody's ever made for anything. Right. So, like, even they they have one loss. You know, Utah, um, for all their faults, they've got a road win over yeah. Baylor, and they beat the hell out of Florida. Yep. So, you yep. know, it just you're you're right, and and Arizona is very competitive. All of a the sudden, their defense is functional, and it makes them a really scary team. You know, they've lost yeah. uh, back to back games by seven that they were multi touchdown underdogs. Yeah, going into, um, I think they were twenty-one point dogs against Washington State at home, and twenty and a half against USC. They lost both those games by a combined nine points. Right. Yeah. So even they're good, it, and and then Colorado can't pass block. They can't run block. They can't stop the run. They can't play man coverage, but they're extraordinarily well coached, well schemed, and they have just a freak at quarterback who, you know, so yeah, every, everyone is good. Everyone is fun except for us and, and, and the trees out in Palo Alto. Um, And Uh, even Cal, Cal has things that they're really good at. They're just very poorly coached. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's just, it's so, you know, I mean, I don't want to get into how the conference died, but it's just like, if, if, if you could have just had this this season last year, then it would be the Big 12 that would be dead and whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's what it is. Um, yeah. It, what did you think of the recent reporting? This was probably like a week or two ago that like Michael Crow, he didn't even – he wasn't like in any contact with the Big 12 really until like the last, the last day. Like it's – or did you not say – yeah. 
I I'm try, try to choose my words carefully here. Arizona State at no <laughs> point had a plan for anything. They were not leaders, <gasps> nor were they innovators, nor did they listen to reason or or the like big outrage mob, right? Like that that that's been a whole big thing is like Ray Anderson and Michael Crow, they hear people complain all the time. And to them, you got to take all these complaints with a grain of salt because it's your job to do these things, not the masses, right? But when you get to the point where 99% of the mob, idiots and the smart, passionate people included, all on the same page, the Pac-12 is dying because of the uh, throttled availability. <clears throat> Apologize. Um, and everybody was on the same page about what was happening with Herm. And everybody's been on the same page uh, about needing to needing to jump ship probably to the to the Big 12 once Colorado made the move. And probably my least favorite feeling in the entire world as a human being is to look at somebody who has training uh, experience, is considered an expert in their field, and they're at the wheel of the car. Right. If I look at that person and I have any feeling anywhere inside me that I could do their job better than them, it scares the hell out of me. My least favorite feeling in the entire world. But I look at the way that the uh, athletic administration has managed um, this predicament, and it made me feel like even somebody as stupid as me could have done a better job. And I cannot take somebody seriously if I feel like I could do better than them at their thing. Yeah. And so I'm having a very hard time taking them seriously because I would have found all different ways to screw this up, but I wouldn't have been behind the eight ball. And they really right. were, and they were defiant and insulting uh, and, and um, uh, came off as highly elitist and dismissive and I think all of that has left a lasting, irreparable bad taste in the mouths of most ASU fans. Yeah. Um, it, oh, yeah. And the thing that's – it's just – like the, the no plan was just obvious this whole summer because there were no, no leaks about anything from ASU. And it, like – even compare that to Utah, where like they were clearly had shared a lot of the same ideas that ASU did about not wanting to go to the Big Twelve, but it, it seemed like they were a little bit more like, okay, well, like, like we have to do this. Whereas like ASU, it clearly was kicking and screaming, and I just like it's because look, I grew up in the Northwest. I have, like I've my dad went to Oregon State. My uh, I have friends that went to Wazoo. Like it's terrible what's happening to them. And ASU almost got in that position just based off their own incompetence, not based <laughs> off. Just not, not based like the, what got them in is just the fact that it's an enormous school and you're in Phoenix. Like that's really it, because the uh, the you know football success over the past you know post 2014 has been mid, and men's basketball obviously these decisions aren't made off men's basketball. So like it's just I'm just so glad this is so done because I, I like I was stressing out about this a lot over the summer. And at the time I was thinking like, oh, this is dumb to stress out about, like, whatever. Like, it, it, if the Pac-12 blows up, they'll just go to the Big 12. And I guess that turned out to be right. But, <laughs> like, looking behind the curtain, it's like, oh, like, we got in, like, last uh, last helicopter out of – I'm forgetting what Vietnamese city it is. I don't want to – Saigon. Speak. Saigon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, like, that – like, we, like, escaped by the skin of our teeth and yeah. it's just, like – it's just like, oh my gosh, like, I, I don't know. It's just, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that I'm sure that in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with Ray Anderson or with Michael Crow, some of the, the intricacies of these things could be explained in a way that might douse some of the, the, the anger and passion sure. that people feel. Um, but because it feels like we're being reactive and not proactive, Anything that they come out and say in a media setting comes off as um, stupid. Yeah. And 
And just the like repeated gaffes of like calling Apple a Star Trek technology, like streaming. Yeah. Streaming is not a Star Trek technology. It is the way that people watch things. But the problem is the people that you want are the people that are not streaming. The people that are not streaming right now are the people who have purchasing power in America. They watch basic cable or pay cable and they have the money to buy the things that are being advertised to them on those channels which is how we all ended up in this mess in the first place because we all started bowing down to the god of television and and thinking about the in-person fans as second class citizens it's why they took seats out of the stadium it's why they don't necessarily encourage, they don't outright discourage, but they don't encourage tailgating. You know, it, it's why people are having a hard time if they have kids like me. I have four kids. What am I supposed to do? Take them to an ASU game that kicks off 15 minutes after their bedtime? Yeah. What the hell is that? How how are my kids supposed to become fans of this team when I have to, you know, to bring my four kids to a game, spend 50 bucks a ticket and carry them out of the stadium because they passed out at halftime? You know, and and that's all the, the entire reason that ASU is kicking off at 830 it has nothing to do with weather. It's so that an empty uh, Chili's that happens to have Pac-12 Network in Sarasota, Florida, can count as in 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 the ratings. Right. You know, yeah. the TVs that are left on all over the country after people already went to bed, because uh, I'll tell you, I live on the East Coast now and watching these games is very hard. It's like passing uh passing um organic chemistry in high school hard. just staying up to watch a game on yeah. a, on a saturday in a in a city where there's nice weather so you mean i can like i can go out and go for a hike and then i got to like settle in for an 11 30 kickoff and try to stay awake yeah good luck yeah. you know so it you know the the whole thing is extraordinarily messy because they they did everything they could to be as friendly as they possibly could to these television networks. Well, the networks are not your friend. They, you're, they're, you're a means to an end for them to make money through advertising. And the only value you have to them is if you bring an audience with you. You can't bring an audience with you if the entire conference throttled availability in favor of ownership to hopefully make more money down the line. Right. Nobody could watch the Pac-12 network Nobody could watch the Pac-12 games on the East Coast because they kicked off too late. And then all of a sudden you go to sell your television rights and nobody wants to watch it. They all lost interest because of the last deal that you struck. You put yourself in this situation and Michael Crow was an enormous part of that. Yep. He, he was Larry Scott's biggest defender and he propped him up for years past when he should have no longer had any involvement with the conference whatsoever. So it's really, really hard to feel sorry for Arizona State. The problem with that is we are Arizona state. Yeah. It affects <laughs> us directly. Um, and we have to find some nuanced way to talk about it. That doesn't make us want to, you know, uh, jump off a bridge because it, you know, it, the idea that any major decision that is made from here on out is going to be made by the same people who put us in this position is a hard thing to process. Do you trust them to make all of the right decisions as we navigate life in the, in the big 12. Um, yeah. I don't. And and there's no way that, I mean, not that I'm not that this matters on the football field, but Michael Crow can say what he can say after getting into the big 12, but there's no way those presidents like, like him. I mean, I, I just, no, he went from the most powerful man in the room or one of the most powerful men in the room yeah. to just another dude. Yeah, and maybe the least powerful person in this room now, considering the preamble to ASU getting into the Big 12. Like, yeah, it's um, – well, I have – okay, so speaking of leadership, uh, just before the USC game, there was an interesting report um, from Doug Franz, a former radio host, mm -hmm. and he walked it back. But I saw that you listened to his ensuing podcast that Monday. I listened to his as well. And he made it sound like, like the boosters are like the stage is being set for Ray to resign or something like that. It was an interest. It wasn't a full back down, which I found to be very interesting. 
here's what's going on. <laughs> okay. So, um, I listened to the same thing you listened to. Doug Franz basically said, I think I got it right. I just didn't get the timing right. He thinks that they're enacting a process to phase Ray Anderson out. Um, that's not a message that's been communicated to the to the boosters at this point. So here's what's about to happen. The people who financially support Arizona State um, are not going to do so anymore. Until Ray Anderson is removed. This is a very dangerous game of chicken because what this involves is the money that's going to be used to fulfill internal promises that have already been made about name, image, and likeness funding and partnerships. So. If that doesn't go through. If the money that was promised to, you know, and it's really tricky navigating these waters because you're talking about people who are pledging money to Sun Angel, which is technically not supposed to be affiliated with ASU, but ASU is aware of it. And the only reason they're pledging the money to ASU is to help ASU. So, you know, there are. It's a complicated labyrinth that I think ASU is actually navigating well and with caution. I would say that Ray Anderson has probably been the most cautious athletic director in the Pac-12 when it comes to accepting NIL money. And this is obviously after he decided that that, you know, we weren't going to be in direct opposition to NIL, which is what caused a bunch of the players to transfer um, prior to Herm's last hurrah. Um, well, Ralph, they're just focusing on developing NFL players and, you know, through the NFL model. Yeah. Uh, can you cuss on this? Oh, go ahead. All right. I'm not I'm not I don't swear that much, but like. So for emphasis. <sighs> the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my entire life. Is that we are going to bring Herm Edwards in to run the pro model. Followed by. We got to get Herm Edwards up out of here because college football got too much like pro sports. So we need somebody who's going to going to be able to navigate that. Those two things both happened. They happened that like we brought somebody in to make Arizona State more like professional football. And then we got rid of that person because he doesn't know how to make Arizona State more like professional football. That's I'm not like I'm not I, I'm not uh, re reducing it for effect. I'm not. Yeah drawing conclusions that don't exist. That's exactly what the Herm Edwards tenure at Arizona State was in one compound sentence. We brought someone in to institute an NFL model of doing things. And when college football started to seem a little bit too much like NFL, we got rid of him. That's what happened. Dumbest shit in the world. In the world. It's a big reason why we, why this man should not be trusted uh, with the future of Arizona State Athletics in his hand, and it's what the boosters understand. So now the boosters want to play chicken. They say, we're not going to fund these things we said we were going to fund unless you get rid of Ray Anderson. On the other side of that bluff, maybe it's a bluff, maybe it's not, is Michael Crow. And he's faced with the decision of saying, you know, Ray Anderson has helped me navigate a lot of things. Um, a lot. You know, but for for people who don't think Ray Anderson actually does anything, um, the job entails a lot more than just football, right? Ray Anderson made an earnest attempt to <sighs> Ray Anderson has made an earnest attempt to improve ASU athletics in a lot of different areas. You can parse some of the things he's done. Um you know, they're still taking money from Bart Ware, or at least I think they are. The brand new scoreboard at the at the at the um swimming facility says from the Bart Ware family. That's brand new. Brand mm. new. Bart Ware, of course, is accused of sexually harassing multiple women at Arizona State, including uh Bobby Hurley's wife and the wife of somebody else who is suing Arizona State for wrongful termination. So 
like psychotic that they'd still be taking yeah. money from him. But, you know, I, I don't think ASU has anybody on the swimming beat who's going to ask these tough questions. You know, multiple volleyball hires. Uh, ASU basketball just had its worst season in almost three decades last year. And Ray Anderson refused to heed Charlie Turner Thorne's recommendation for her own replacement, who is now coaching the Phoenix Mercury. So, you know, baseball was an interesting one because he he made the Tracy Smith hire. He stuck with Tracy Smith three years longer than anybody wanted him to. And when it when the dust settled, the person that hated Ray Anderson the most and was his biggest critic was Tracy Smith. Yeah, still is. <laughs> yeah. So like there's this like marriage between like Tracy Smith and the people that hate Ray Anderson. Uh but for very different reasons, like opposing, literally opposing. Right, reasons. right. Right. So you can point to all of these things that are confusing about Ray Anderson's tenure. And then you can point to other things um, like hockey, yep. like the stadium yeah. naming rights, which annoyed people. But guess what? That's free money. Yeah. Free money to say Mountain America Stadium. Which clearly ASU needs, obviously. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, there, and I'll be honest with you. There are players that I know that I talk to who have a very favorable opinion of Ray Anderson because he makes himself available to the players to help them in any career aspirations. Uh, and then you have the like extreme improvement on the academic end. So there, like there are pros and anybody who's not willing to admit that, you know, because football is the most important thing to them is not somebody that, that ASU administration is going to listen to because right. they have their list of of tangible things that Ray Anderson has helped accomplish. Well, like, we, Hey, we have a list too. We have a list too of ways that he has uh, embarrassed Arizona state sports failed to understand the culture of the Arizona state football fan and his biggest gamble, which had a very, very obvious downside. Yep. From um, the beginning, yep. from the beginning. Yeah. Yep realize that downside in a bigger way than we could have ever even imagined at all. And, and, and there seems to be no accountability or culpability for that. And then beyond that, there's the thing that everybody gets frustrated about, which was if you had a coach that wanted to quit because you said it was a mutual decision, mutual decision of, of, I don't want you here. You don't want to be here. It doesn't even need to be a mutual decision because if you don't want to be here, you can resign. And if you resign, we don't have to pay you. So what is the point of a mutual decision if somebody wanted to quit? What is yeah. the point of that? Herm Edwards said, I want to quit. And you said, hold on there, buddy. Let me write this check for $4 million and we can call it something else instead. Or, or he didn't want to quit. You lied. This is the other option. Either he wanted to quit, you gave him money for no reason, which should be a fireable offense. And not like fired from your job, like put in a rocket and fired to the moon, right? <laughs> That's fraudulent. It's fraudulent. It feels like stealing university and taxpayer and donor money. Yeah, yeah just to do Every, your buddy a solid. Yeah. <laughs> Everything about it feels just absolutely disgusting. And people will tell you, uh, oh, he recused himself. This was something that the uh, you know ABOR decided. Like, no, no, he was very actively involved in whatever conversations took place over that night after the Eastern Michigan uh, yeah. loss, also, which is what if, he went out and told people is that, like, it was a mutual decision. Yeah. The other side of this is he didn't want to quit. You lied and said that he did. And you gave him four million dollars because you didn't fire him for cause when you had every opportunity to fire him for cause. So either way. You did something that should get you fired. Everyone knows it, even the dumbest of Arizona State fans, even me, <laughs> even I know it. So, like, it, and if we all know that, then you being there is just, it, 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 your presence is an insult. Your mere yeah. presence is an insult. It makes it really hard to see the forest for the trees and every other positive thing that happened. And now it seems like most of the major donors have this exact perspective. They want to play chicken. And Michael Crow is basically saying like, oh, so you would see your precious programs fail. 
you're going to hang Kenny Dillingham out to dry. You would tank the football program to get Ray Anderson out of here. And I just want to know what motivation does Michael Crow actually have to make that change? Are people really willing to tank the football team in order to get Ray out of here? Because doing that could could cause irreparable damage. It could eliminate you from being able to bring in the type of athletic director candidate that would actually be able to fix yeah. any of this. It's a dangerous, dangerous game of chicken. Absolutely. And it's like, what incentive does Michael Crow, what, what, where does this level of commitment? I mean, we just walk through all of everything that has happened with under Ray Anderson. And it's like, where has this commitment to Ray Anderson come from? What do you think that nobody ever asks themselves this question? What do you think Michael Crow's primary goal is for Arizona state athletics? To, oh, that's a good, I would say, to it always seems like the, the academic element of it. <laughs> like it always seems like that's what's mentioned. But Mark, would, what were you going to say? I would say, well, he definitely wants, and rightly so, he wants the athletes to have good grades. Like there, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I would think it would be to be attractive enough that people like going to games, buy tickets, uh, you know, all that type of stuff. But also not, not anything that he really has to like deal with you know i feel like he treats it like it's he always calls it the front porch of the school and I, it's like everyone else in his neighborhood is always trying to upgrade their front porch and he's just like no my front porch is fine it has rails on it and there's stairs that go up it and you know in in the mountain west that is a good strategy but in pac 12 or big 12 it's it's not and so i think it's i think it's it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's a means to an end, I would say. Okay. For me. What is the answer? Let's hear it. I, I just think for me, and I think, I yeah. think you actually were, you were, you were onto something at the end there. To me, it's sustainability. To me, his one priority for Arizona State Athletics is for it to pay for itself. Mm. Because you're in a zero sum nonprofit situation. Every dollar that comes in has to go out. Balancing the budget for Arizona State Athletics or any department within a major university is a full-time job. So I think the primary priority for the president of Arizona State University when it comes to sports is that it supports itself. I think that's it. Yeah. I think the rest of it is just noise to him. Low-level stuff that a president of a university shouldn't necessarily have to concern themselves, themselves with. As long as this is paying for itself, I don't think there's an issue to him. Definitely an issue, but I don't think there's an issue to him. The person that has helped this program pay for itself is Ray Anderson. Yeah. Whether he's done the best job, up for debate, but he has been in that position. And here's one thing we know about Michael Crow. His biggest defense of Larry Scott was... When we hired him, we had a little, and now we have a lot. That was it. Yeah. We used to have a little, now we have a lot. He was quoting J Lo song lyrics in his defense of, of, of Larry Scott. So if that was something that he has presented over and over again publicly, uh, as something that makes him feel comfortable with keeping Larry Scott on board, look at ASU's athletic budget, what it used to be when Ray Anderson came on. Look at what it is now. Look at uh, the, yeah, you can like have the look at the academic numbers and everything like that, but just look at the money they had and the money they have. Now, it's college sports. Everybody's budget, but budget's going up. Everybody's eating, right? Like you could have made money on accident, but yep. that's not the way that, that Michael Crow understands it. In his defense of Larry Scott, he's like, no, look, we, we, we signed this big TV deal because of him. You would have signed that big TV deal if a chimpanzee was the – they were giving out money. Yep. They were giving it away. So, you know, that's not necessarily the case when it comes to an athletic department, though. You actually do have tangible things that Ray Anderson has done to make sure that, that he's growing and sustaining uh, the athletic department. And ASU was one of the only schools that, that wasn't making people take a pay cut, uh, you know, during COVID. So 
I'm sure that that Michael Crow has just a laundry list of things that he knows Ray Anderson takes headaches away from him. The I, I and and I think that most people understand at a base level, you would have to make it a bigger headache for Michael Crow to keep Ray Anderson on than you than the headache of finding somebody new and getting them trained up would be. Uh, and right now, I think that that's the that's the the way that Michael Crow is weighing it is. Yeah, I could fire Ray Anderson, and yeah, some donors could pour a, a, a few dollars in here and there, but like, I'm gonna I'm gonna call their bluff and say that they have their coach that they wanted. Everybody wanted Kenny Dillingham. They're not gonna tank the program for one dude. So let me call their bluff. Let me keep this guy on, and I think that's the situation we're in right now. Unless Doug Franz was correct, and they are actually in process of getting his ass up out of there, which. You know, I don't know Doug Franz. I don't know his sources. I like to think from my time listening to him that he is not the type of person that wants to receive the negative attention that came out of his uh, reports that did not end up being true. I don't think you'll see him do that again unless it absolutely is 100 percent solid. Um, but I it, understand that something is definitely going on behind the scenes. I can tell you that from just my personal knowledge. ASU's NIL program is in trouble right now. It is in trouble because the people that committed money to it might not come through on those commitments. And the people that are willing to commit money to it aren't going to make that commitment until they see a change. And that's that. So that's where we're at. It's a game of chicken unless Michael Crow has actually started this process and just hasn't told anybody. Um, and they are going to maybe move Ray Anderson to maybe a different response. Cause this is the other thing is I don't see him getting fired. I see him being there through the end of his contract. So my guess is they would reassign some duties. Cause even if someone came to Michael Crow right now and said, I'll fully fund his buyout. I, I don't think that appeals to Michael Crow. I think, um, I don't, I don't think he wants to be somebody who's out here and making uh, firing people and admitting failure. Yeah, that all, Interesting. All makes sense. And it, yeah, that it's uh, treacherous. I mean, if if it's people withholding NIL money, like that's the name of the game, you know, and it's like the kid, it's the kid who's in that situation, right? Like, yes. isn't that who is is most at risk if you're if you're trying to go back on something you said you were going to do? Like, yep. And this game of chicken would have been more sustainable had Utah not just announced the deal that their kids got. Oh, right. The, yeah, the truck. That's putting pressure on everybody, on everybody. Because if Utah is giving you a truck while ASU is not giving you the thing they said they were going to give you, that, that stuff gets around. Yep. Yeah. 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 That's it's it. It's just I wish someone could just like. I don't know, just yell at Michael Crow being like. If you have a kick-ass football program, you will get more students to apply to your school. Like, every, like yeah. it will – it like, that's the thing that, like – because we know Michael Crow is, like, he wants money for the – like, he is money motivated, like, clearly. Yeah. And just, like, just – it's just common sense to me that, like, hey, if you build a football program that's, like, it's not crazy when they get – like, they have – a football program that it's like the first three years of the Todd Graham era. I'm not even asking for like going 11 and one or anything like that. Just like sustained goodness, you know, and that would help the school. Like there would be more kids who would be interested. There would just be more uh, visibility for ASU. And just, it's just upsetting that that doesn't matter to him, you know? Yes, the ideal the ideal Arizona State program is one that every three years or so is is uh, putting together a double digit win season, and it is a team with personality that reflects the the both the the regional and cultural sensibilities of the student body. ASU is a very fun place to go to school. Yes, it's a very enterprising city. Um, NIL should be cake here uh, and personality should be overflowing 
we have the perfect environment for somebody to come in. Like I'm not saying Dion, but like Dion Sanders, who right. could just be themselves. You could be a character. Todd Graham was a character. Herm Edwards was a character. Kenny Dillingham is, you know, a 33 year old Yoda, you know, with all his, you know, wisdom and sayings and, and, and stuff like that. You know, you can, you can come here, you can be yourself. You can make a little bit of money doing it. And all the fans really want is to be entertained and feel like they have a chance. That's it. It's that simple. And right now we don't feel like we have a chance. The sanctions are a big part of that. And it's not a very entertaining brand of football, you know, to it's better than I thought it'd be, um, especially after that Fresno state game. But you know, there's eight home games this year and are the people that show up to all eight of them are going to see seven losses probably. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. It's uh Thank God the, her, you know, the Bobby Hurley seems to be working out because that's the right. <laughs> and volume, uh, no ASU. Volume. Have you? But yeah, that's true. Have volleyball. you guys seen the? Oh, sorry, sorry. What were we gonna say, Mark? Oh, just mentioning how good volleyball is. That's it. Yeah. I was gonna say, have you guys seen the? And I don't know if these are what the trucks actually look like, but I just looked it up, and it's it's just a Dodge Ram truck, but like plastered in. Yeah, Utah, rams. like, yeah, is is that what Crimson. they all look like? No, so apparently they came out and said that they they'll all have some sort of insignia advertising oh. the Crimson Collective, but yeah, no, it would have been very funny if there were eighty five fully wrapped trucks that looked like the one uh, that you're yeah. talking about because they're all going to be parking in the same <laughs> parking lot and the and it's just, just a like, fleet. Yeah, my guess is there will be there will be they're all going to have the same package. Uh, the same uh, truck package. I think all, all the features will be the exact same, but they're going to have to differentiate a little bit. Cause like I already struggle if I walk into a mall parking lot and there's another blue Hyundai, <laughs> like, yeah. like a full door sport. I'm like, uh, which car I'm like checking to, to make sure I don't try to open somebody else's car door. Yep. Um, yeah. Imagine, imagine 85. 85. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 85 yeah. blue Hondas, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> Honestly, like if I were a Utah player, I'd be like, hey, can I just get some money? Like whatever the money equivalent of me leasing this truck is like, but that's just me. Yeah. Uh, Mark's Mark sticking with the Jeep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it is it that the point of Utah kind of putting pressure. It's it's a good thing, you know, because it puts pressure and. If the last 20 years of ASU athletics have shown us anything, like there needs to be pressure put on for Michael Crow to do something. Yeah. Uh, and But at the same time, it's like, yeah, it's putting on pressure because it's something that ASU can't do right now, despite being in a larger market and having, you know, I don't know if ASU has more fans than Utah, just because I think it's, I think it is a little different when there's a pro team in the state, but I'm not going to go on that uh, yeah. topic now, but at least a large enough amount of fans. Right. More. Yeah. I, yeah. I think there's, there's more fans, but also like Utah has that thing yeah. of where they, they have hope and they also, every game they've ever walked into, they act like they're the underdog. And so that creates this other mix and level of energy in Salt Lake. That's just a whole lot of fun and really annoying if you're an opponent of theirs. Um, because right. now they are the big bad wolf on the block. And I know the big 12 doesn't want to hear this, but they're going to be the same way when they come to your conference and ruin your life. <laughs> it's I coming. Oh, I, I can't wait for Utah to just run over teams in the big 12. Cause they, those big 12 fans do not like Utah at all. No. And I, what I want to tell them is like, do you see that 14 to six loss that Baylor took at home where Utah didn't score a touchdown until halfway through the fourth quarter, get used to that. Because that exact thing is going to continue to happen to all of your teams, and it is super annoying. Um, but but so the, but they've had they have been they've had hope, they have been competitive, and they've had continuity. Yeah. ASU needs continuity, and it will get to the point where it is competitive. And then when people have the hope, you know, as long as you don't let them down, like what would happen in the Todd Graham and and Dennis Erickson and Dirk Cutter years, you, the second you get ranked, you get blown out by fifty. You know, as long as you just stay competitive and yeah. it's the funny thing, Ray Anderson always used to say competitive consistency. That is the thing we need. But it, the purpose of it needs to be for sustained hope for the fan base. If you don't feel like you have a chance, why participate? 
right? Like people buy lottery tickets because of the very minuscule chance that they might win. Less and less people are engaging with Arizona State athletics over the last three years because they're, it's hopeless. Yeah, it feel it feels devoid of hope. The style of play was not entertaining. So, were you going to go to these games and leave depressed after a thirteen to ten win that you know just sets you up for failure against your ranked opponent next week? Like not a lot of people are bought into that style. And so when ASU finally started like, oh, we need somebody young who understands NIL, who can talk to kids, who understands the transfer portal, and who will also put together an exciting offense, I think they made the right decision. You know, when it comes to the coach, it's just a matter of whether whether or not, you know, they're going to be able to cash some of these checks. Uh, When Kenny Dillingham came out and said, if Nap Lawrence wouldn't have pledged a million dollars, we wouldn't have a football team right now. Do you remember him saying that? Yeah. Okay. On its face, seems like a an outright lie. I'm gonna tell you, I don't think he thinks he's lying. Yeah. I mean, and so this thing of playing chicken right now, that's what's on the other side. Your own head coach believes that if these checks don't clear, the football team goes away. Yeah. No, it's it's. I just, it's, that's what, when you made that point about Ray Anderson, you know, being on the wheel and not trusting him, that's kind of how I feel about Michael Crow, specifically when it comes to, not the school in general, he's done a good job, and that's why he still is there. Uh, But when it specifically comes to, like, caring about the sports that the vast majority of the fan base cares about, for better or worse, you know, that's just how it is. He, like, I do, there's no trust in that. And I don't know. I mean, Colton, I've mentioned this to Colton on this show a bunch of times, but like, it just feels like as ASU fans, we're just kind of playing or ASU fans who like really follow it. You're kind of just playing the waiting game of like, when is Crow going to leave? Because he's not going to change his mind on this stuff. It feels like, and I hate kind of having that mindset, but you know, yeah, that, that's what pops in my head a lot. The 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 goal for ASU fans with Michael Crow should be to not be on his radar. Yeah. <laughs> let him let him come swoop in and take credit once we have a couple of 10 win seasons in a row. Yeah. But he he needs to be viewed as like a uh you know these Silicon Valley tech startups, you know, they have these, these brilliant minds, or at least these brilliant idea stealers, you know, they'll come up with an idea for a company and in order to put it into action or to get it into the testing phase or to do research and development, they got to get money. Right. So they'll go to a venture capitalist and they'll say, here is my vision. We need money to get this started. You'll have ownership in what we're doing, but what I need from you is to trust that like, we know what we're doing. I need your vote of confidence is your money. That's what I need. I just need your money. What they don't want is that person coming around, checking on them, changing things, thinking that they're the one in charge, having ideas and putting themselves into the process. What you want is a good venture capitalist who's going to give you the resources to succeed and then get the hell out of your way. Yeah. That is what Arizona State needs from Michael Crow. They need him the hell out of their way on the athletic side. And our beef with the university is what's bringing him around to have to answer for some of these things, which is what makes him want to medal. And it's just, you know, I can't, I can't wait once we get into the big 12 and we don't have negotiations on the horizon and our university president isn't in a place of power where he's able to meddle and manipulate the direction of the big 12 because he's lost that seat at the table. And our football team is gaining some traction because Kenny Dillingham has put them in a in a in a in a place to succeed. And hopefully that success brings in the donations that are necessary to maintain the status quo in the new era of college football. Once all that's going on, there's less and less reason for Michael Crow to be around to do anything other than shake the coach's hand as they walk off the field after a win. And that's the Michael Crow. You know, you you talk about wanting him gone. I don't know if they'll ever get rid of him because he's done an incredible job at making sure that ASU's bills are paid and its reputation has, has been enhanced. 
you know, people honestly believe that U.S. News and World Report thing matters. Like to be able to say that we're number one in innovation, it's 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 gotten to the point where like it was cool the first couple of years, but like we're all in on the joke now, right? Like this is not actually a quantifiable thing. Yeah. What is it's it? Ne- a- it's a nebulous. <laughs> oh, yes. And that's why when they sent out that tweet, which was rank number one, comma, in areas that matter, it's like, oh, well, you're telling me that high, high end sports doesn't matter to you. <laughs> that's what you're telling me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was, that was very frustrating. But like, I think about it in the way of like yearbook superlatives, right? Class clown, quantifiable, funniest person in class, you know? Best right. couple. Well, you, you're obviously going to judge between the couples right. that exist. You're gonna, not going to make one up. School Spirit Award? That's a guess. That's somebody that, like, that we, we don't have, like, a metric yeah. for that. And that's what the innovation thing to me is like, oh, we got, we got an, another, our ninth School Spirit Award badge in a row. Like, meanwhile, our lack of innovation in sports is killing, killing off programs. And we have to eat this propaganda from the school that we know is not being innovative, that we know is holding really, really tight to a non-functioning status quo, you know, when it comes to like a Larry Scott or participation in the, 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 you know, trying to keep the PAC nine together. Um, we're seeing like an extreme amount of lack of innovation uh, while having these awards rubbed in our face. And it's just the dissonance, yeah. I just like they have to understand that the three people that are on this right now are, are not saying like there's nobody that would argue the inverse of this. Everyone hates the direction of ASU athletics right now under Michael Crow and Ray Anderson. And if they don't know how to articulate th- uh, articulate that they hate it, they know they hate it. They just don't have these words yet. They don't, like that's that's it. Everybody's on the same page except for the two people in charge. And so either we're going to get pulled up out of this hole on accident by women's basketball getting better, football getting better, um, you know, volleyball sustaining whatever it's doing now. um, And then and then hopefully, you know, Bobby Hurley makes a run or something like that. You know, either we're just going to start having success and a lot of these underlying pain points are going to feel like less pressure only to reappear again if we have any adversity at all um or we're gonna make the change now go through the hell that it takes to get healthy and start building our way back up um as an athletic program but like it it, i don't know i would i i don't know i i just don't know if michael crow sees any motivation whatsoever to make his own life harder by bringing somebody new in. And unless it's somebody new, there's no guarantee that it's not going to be the same trajectory and more, more of what we're already. Yeah. What we're, I will tell you this, whoever they bring in uh, to be the next athletic director, could, could they not please not be a former agent <laughs> with yeah. clients that they can potentially, you know, dip into that Rolodex to, Hire for jobs because then, it's it's not just the coaches that he's hired, but a lot of the staff that they've brought in are people that he had like prior relationships with at Octagon or through the NFL. It's been the most incestuous. I mean, it's been what you think business is, that it's not what you know, it's who you know. Uh, there's not been a lot of merit-based, research-based hires happening at ASU. And then mutually part ways with them. Because yeah. it was what does that even mean? <laughs> I'd love to know. I would just love to know what that. I think I was on here last time when I was like, think about two people, like, all right, I'm thinking something crazy, and the other person's like, me too. Yep. yep. Okay. Let's both <laughs> yeah, say I it on three. Because otherwise, how do you come to a somebody talked first? Right. Right. So then the decision's made. Yep. Yep. If her Herm's like, I'm done. They need a new voice. Yep. Then that's the end of that conversation. That conversation ends right yeah. there. Oh, it's it's, wild. I, Ralph, I had so much jealousy this week seeing the Washington's new AD get hired. And I just see these quotes, and it's just like saying the most obvious things like, football is the 1,000-pound gorilla. We need to support it. And I'm just like, 
<laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I looked at his background. It's like, oh, he was the 80 at Northern Iowa. Oh, he was the 80 at Tulane. Oh, so he's just like actually done this before at smaller schools with fewer resources. Like that's just right. such the obvious track. It's like they're and he uh, knows he knows the right thing to say, but if you actually look at his background at Tulane, he got hired for very Pac-12 reasons. They're like number one in beach volleyball right now. Mm. They made the bowling playoffs. They won a sailing national championship. Like he very much got hired for like the Larry Scott Pac-12 reasons bro, of like bro. we play 10 more sports than everybody else so you have to have somebody that can that has peripheral vision for those things but you do have to come in and say that football is the is the driver behind the ability to even have success in all of those different yes. things that you do yeah yeah I, I just, and sailing are heavy hitters though ralph i didn't I, so I found out that ncaa bowling existed from his resume oh nice what i didn't a way even to find know out. Yeah. yeah, I didn't either. I just learned don't, from you. Don't tell so. Michael Crow about that because then the instant our bowling team makes the final four, it's like, see? <laughs> see? Ooh, you think about some <laughs> Adidas bowling, sh- Arizona State color bowling shoes? Ooh, Hardens. <laughs> <laughs> some Harden bowling Harden shoes. Bowling shoes. <laughs> 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 That'd go hard. Oh, my God. Oh, hey, the man this. knows how to draw contact. It'd be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, okay. Uh, let's talk about just actual on-the-field play in the Big sure. 12 next year. So, assuming ASU has, I don't know, uh, sufficient or barely sufficient NIL backing and they have a team that is grows a little bit from where they're at now – I guess it depends on who you play. We don't know how the schedule is going to be shaked out, but it's just, it feels like there's just, if, if ASU can just become like an average team next year, there's a lot of just games that they can win, you know, and it's just going to be so interesting because yeah. you're going to have new, un, you know, unfamiliar opponents coming in and that's going to be interesting. And then, yeah. And it's just, you're, it's, it's, there's just so many questions. Yes, uh, I think to just right off the bat, Arizona State has an advantage in the Big 12 uh, for geographic reasons, having recruiting access to both, well, to all three, to California, Arizona, and Texas is going to put them in a place where uh, it's going to be a little bit easier to succeed than if you're Kansas, right? So they're going to come in with a, a regional advantage They're going to come in being one of the crown jewel cities of the Big 12. Uh, They're going to have enough resources being part of the Big 12 to be able to retain staff members because that's really been the biggest thing in all of this is, you know, the Big 10 over the course of 10 years out earns the Pac-12 by $1 billion. That's money that gets spent on facilities, administrators, assistant coaches, things like that, that if you're ASU, you know, you had five straight years of a different offensive coordinator, six straight years of a different offensive line coach. You know, a big part of that is not being able to compensate people in a way that would keep them around long term, um, which has turned ASU and a lot of other Pac-12 jobs into kind of stepping stone jobs. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case in the Big 12. I think the resources will be there to retain people unless SEC schools or whatever come calling, then you know there's nothing you could do. And that was I, and that was the case beforehand too. Like mm-hmm. so yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh but yeah, I think um honestly, uh f- as far as the the cities that ASU fans are going to get to visit, I think it's going to be an education. Um, I remember very clearly when Arizona State played at Texas Tech, I want to say in 28, no, couldn't have been 2018 because that was a Herm era. 2017. Okay, yeah. yeah. So went to Texas Tech. Um, Texas Tech had like Kiki Cote and, and, and a couple of really good skilled players. I think they ended up beating ASU. But one of the things that I really appreciated about that game is beforehand, Todd Graham was going around to every player and saying like, hey, I want you paying attention during the national. I want you to soak this in because this is what we're trying to build in Arizona. So they, you know, they came in the whole, everybody was in their seats for the national anthem. There was a flyover. The crowd was raucous. And this is in Lubbock. Every city in the big 12 is like this, you know? And so I think it's going to be, 
I don't think ASU wants to be the Stanford of the Big 12. Right. You know, well, Michael Crow wants it to be, but for different reasons, right? But you don't want it to be the one stadium where you go to and it's only half full. Yeah. Because every stadium in the Big 12 is going to be rocking no matter if you're good or not. Um, and I think that's the thing that I look forward to the most. The other thing is basketball is going to be awesome. <laughs> Big 12 basketball is so ridiculous. Yeah. It's like a super conference. And you can like, you can, your whole program can fall apart. And within two years, you can be back to competing for a national championship. Like that is how, how um, good some of these schools have gotten at, at, you know, crafting their reputation amongst the, the elite handlers and club coaches and high school coaches all over the country well and just being in a much better conference you go 18 and 12 in the pac 12 you're not going to the tournament you go 18 and 12 in the big 12 you might be an eight seed you know it's exactly yeah yeah because the losses don't penalize you as much and let i mean there's going to be bad teams but yeah not many though yeah no it's yeah exactly yeah uh and and we're and and we're going (laughs) with arizona so it's it's Big 12 basketball minus yeah. Texas and Oklahoma, which was probably like their third and fifth most prestigious men's basketball programs. Yeah. Um, and then you're adding Arizona. <laughs> so like and they don't fall off that much. They still got Kansas, Kansas State, Baylor, Iowa State, you know, all these schools that um, that are perennially are, yeah. are contenders. Yeah. And that's going to be a lot of fun. I think from a fan perspective. This will be a very enjoyable move from a nostalgist perspective. Like this is the worst thing in the world. Yeah, like the well, yeah. dissolution of the Pac-12 is the worst. It's just, yeah. I don't know. It, it was just such a cool conference. I don't know about Colorado. Like they can, they didn't really, I don't really ever felt like they belonged and Utah like made their place here. They made themselves a um, a real uh, contender in a lot of different areas. But but as far as the ten schools that were together before those two joined, losing that is insane to me. It's all I've ever known. Same. It's yeah. No, it's I agree. And yeah, no, it's just that's why like I get that's why I'm happy we're going to the Big Twelve just because it's the life raft that we needed and you know, we almost declined to get on. I just, yeah. I just can't, that whole, the, how, how they handle that is just so, so bad, but I'm not going to, we talked about that already, but yeah, it's like it, it but yeah, the, I mean, obviously losing the PAC 12 sucks. And I, I haven't been following the lawsuits with uh, Oregon state, and Washington state, but I hope they can, I hope they have the best case scenario for them possible, but my, my, my hope for them is that they find a way to approach the mountain West and merge keep the branding and we'll have an, the, you know, maybe the mountain West will go away and we'll have, and I'm a mountain West fan, but you know, if, if you can add Washington state and Oregon state and then up the level of resources slightly that everybody else gets, I think that they'll enjoy it. I, I, I think that Pullman and uh, Corvallis fit in with like Logan, Utah and, and, uh, and Fort Collins lit. Laramie is its own that's Bermuda, true. That's Bermuda true. Triangle. Uh, just I mean, the whole state of, I know you grew up in Wyoming. I lived there for one year. I mean, and I lived in like the most remote area, <laughs> but yes, it's, it it's, it's a different world. It is so Colton, it just the I amount of just long there. I remember that. where you're just in the middle of nowhere and it's like, Oh, still two hours to get to town X. It's like, yep. Yeah. No, I almost moved to, um, for a reporting job. I want to say it was called um, oh Douglas. I want to say and Douglas. And it it Douglas. was forty five minutes from the near Casper, which was like where we'd have to go for anything, basically. Yeah, and Douglas, like my my cousin is like the mayor of Douglas, and it's really a couple of thousand people, <laughs> one golf course, wind, no trees, wind. Yeah. So like February is literal hell. Yeah, I don't not to get on the topic of Wyoming or whatever, but they're like it, <laughs> it, on the same day on the having same lived day, in Gillette for a year. Yeah, 
And Gillette, <laughs> Gillette is like a, not a good place. So no, it, oh my god, okay. Like objectively, it's a it bad. Is so it's so funny because when I lived there, I was like, I was so excited to move to Wyoming. I should have been more uh, proficient on Google Maps because it, it's it is in the middle of nowhere. There's no reason for the town to exist other than that there's natural resources nearby. And yeah, because you're you're from Sheridan, right? Yes, which is two what two hours away, and yeah. quite possibly God's gift to the planet. It's the yeah, it's it's the it's the it's, it's the like local, very it's very Tempe Tucson. It it it's funny because Colton, they're local rivals, but it's like a two hour drive, which it, it's oh, it, it, that is very Tempe. There Tucson. are games if you're what's the like Rock Springs to Gillette's probably like eight hours, and they have to play each other in like high school football. It's I don't it, that's crazy to me, but that bus uh, ride is probably brutal. Yeah, yes, <laughs> but like Sheridan is like if I I would have been much happier in Sheridan because there's mountains there. You know, it actually looks it's pretty, and you know I, I would have had other you know issues being a young single person living there, not knowing anyone. But it would have been better than Gillette. And I, if anyone from Gillette is listening, like I'm sorry, they know. <laughs> yeah, I think. They I know. think we just became the the foremost authority uh, as far as Wyoming podcasts go. Yeah, I think we just pivoted. There's not many people that live there. We're not an ASU <laughs> podcast yeah. anymore. Well, you can claim it, and they'd never know that you did because they're not going to watch this. So. <laughs> no, but anyway, but this long winded point was like whenever I was telling other people, like if I was in Casper or some other city, like oh yeah, I live in Gillette, and they're like oof. <laughs> I was just, like, I was like yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I the anyway, but to the yeah. the overarching point is that there's cool cities that are left over for those two to be part of, and Kyle Whittingham seems to think that this is, you know, this could all come back together. He he thinks that like know. we that we could consolidate to the point where we realized we had it better originally. So his thought seems to be that you know three four years from now maybe that we get the band back together and we have Pac-12 Part Two. Um, and I kind of got my fingers crossed for that, but I, I want ASU to make the absolute best of their time in the Big 12. And there's and, and not being the only newbie is going to be fun, too. Cincinnati's going to be in there. UCF, which is basically the ASU of the Southeast, yeah. they got 60,000 mm -hmm. students in a town that also has pro sports. Yep. Um, you know, and a great journalism program and all that. Like, so it, it'll be in, in psychotic fans, absolutely yeah. psychotic fans. Having so BYU be, in the conference is going to be great. That's real cool. I yeah. hate BYU. I just grew up, you know, everybody, everybody wants to beat BYU. Right. Um, and when I was a kid, they were like fresh off a national championship, uh, you know, right. rubbing Steve Young and everybody's faces and Danny Ainge. But like having them around is, I mean, you talk about Dion helping a ASU sell tickets. BYU is going to do the same. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that, that's another cool thing is just like there's going to be there are so many people in Arizona from so many places. They're going to have access to ASU athletics as their venue to see their hometown teams. Right. Where we we do have that with the Pac-12, but it's become a novelty. If you're from Stillwater and you're making your living in Mesa or Goodyear or something like that, and you have the opportunity to see Oklahoma State come to town now, like that's going to be a really big deal. You're going to go all out for that because you haven't had access to that on a regular basis before. So I think it's going to be there. There's going to be some financial benefit just because of the transient population of Arizona. You're going to see a lot of opposing in the same way that you do with all Arizona sports, but you're going to see a lot, not just opposing dollars, but excitement behind that because yeah. they're going to get to come out and see some of these teams for the first time that they haven't got to see in a long time. Iowa state fans. I bet there's going to be, cause that is a, but one thing I did, like Iowa state is a way bigger school than I thought it was. And it has a huge, a larger fan base than I thought it did too. Yeah. Um, and I, I was reading something that said there's like 16,000 ASU graduates in the, like in the, uh, three major cities in texas that makes sense oh yeah so yeah. when asu is going to play these games you know against TCU, against tcu yeah. and stuff like that then you're going to have really really like good asu representation on the road too houston. It's gonna be a lot of fun yeah houston absolutely yeah no i'm i'm excited i'm it, like i'm excited because it's like okay at least we're in this and it's like okay like this is there's at least some regionality you know it's it's 
it's basically all the states surrounding New Mexico, but not actually any school in New Mexico. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, it, it's at least you get like it's regionality, and then there's a few outliers on the east. But uh, of course, one school that Ray Anderson would never want to go to. <laughs> what a wild! I totally knew what he was talking about, but what a wild thing to say. Oh yeah. To a very unforgiving group of people, by the way. Have you yeah. guys watched the Eat Shit Pit video? No, but I, I've oh. seen some of the t-shirts. <laughs> uh, please Google West Virginia Sweet Caroline as soon as we get off this podcast. Oh. It will change yeah, your I'm, life. I'm adding it to my list now. It's called Eat Shit Pit? Yeah, or what it's, did you it's say? Uh, we, uh, University of West Virginia, when they sing Sweet Caroline at their games, they substitute the ba 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 <laughs> with Eat Shit Pit. <laughs> but they turn the music down at that part, so it's oh, just oh, sixty thousand strong hitting it at the exact same time. These people are—they're nuts. Yeah. Todd oh, Graham yeah. got I his just, start. I just out. found it. Yeah. <laughs> Todd Graham got his start at uh, WVU. It was his first job as an assistant, and he worked under Rich Rodriguez. And then he ended up after a couple of stops with the head coaching job at Pitt. And yeah. I've talked to Todd Graham and Rich Rodriguez about the difference between Pitt, West Virginia and Arizona, Arizona state. And they were like, Arizona, Arizona state's nasty, but like Pitt, West Virginia, you'd like pull up in the bus driving onto campus. And there'd be like a line of old ladies who graduated in 1960, all there ready to moon you <laughs> and flip you off. Like that, that's just like generational hate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, and yeah, so it's going to be it, it, ASU's reception the first time they go to Morgantown is going to be very interesting. Yeah, I, a part of me is like, I hope that they have that game in the first year if, if they do go to Morgantown, because I mean, eventually I would figure like a comment like that is probably just going to fade over time if. Because, I mean, the thing is, like, ASU is not going to play a lot of these Eastern teams that often. That's the other thing. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. It'll, so, it'll, it'll also be interesting to see how some of the sports that are going to be traveling a lot more than they would have otherwise handle some of these things. I know that um, the ACC is going to have, like, centralized matchups for a lot of their Olympic right. sports. They're just going to have teams meet in Dallas and do all their stuff there. Um, which will make for a really interesting recruiting situation because if you're in Dallas, you just commit to an ACC school and your family can come see you play, you know, for yeah. all your games. Um, right in ACC I, country. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do wonder how it's going to reshape the way that Arizona State Athletics recruits. Like, yeah. because we have over, over the years recruited Tennessee, recruited Virginia, recruited Ohio, and most of those players have really struggled to acclimate in Tempe. Like, really struggle. I could give you a list of names right now, and when I said them out loud, you'd be like, oh, yeah, they had a really hard time. Uh, well, I mean, just uh, – Wait, like a hard Kareem time. Moore is from Tennessee, and he left, and now – I mean, because we just had a Kareem Moore conversation randomly, like, two shows ago. Yep. But, uh, yep. uh, that, was was, good. that was wild. Jason Lewis. I do not remember that name, but he was like the six three two forty running back, the four star that came from Virginia. He was with Balage and Demario Richard. He was much. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't remember that at all. But yeah, uh, he he yeah. he he had a really hard time acclimating to the environment. Had to go back to the East Coast. Robbie Robinson, Robbie Robinson's mm. from Virginia Beach. You know, his tenure at ASU ended about as bad as anything can end. Right. Uh, you know, uh, they, what, they what areas did they like struggle with? What was it like when you say acclimating? Is it like the the environment? Yeah. Like what what was it? It's uh, so there's this like gas tank theory uh -huh. that, you know, if you recruit within 500 miles, anywhere that you can get on, on a tank of gas, the mm. it's far enough away that you're not going to go home all the time, but you do have the ability to check in and to recharge. So, you know, ASU recruiting people from the Inland Empire, they're not going to go home every weekend. Right. You know, they're not going to want to drive through Blythe every weekend, but they're going to be able to go like on a week like this, on a bye week, they're probably going to be able to go home. Yeah. Right. And the chance of them running into other people from the Inland Empire, it's very high. You go and get somebody from Newport News, Virginia on the coast. They're probably not going to run into a lot of people that they have very much in common with. Mm -hmm. Culturally regionally 
getting home is going to be a lot tougher. Getting family to come out and see them play is going to be a lot tougher. You just see the further you get away from home, unless a support system on campus is really built in, um, the retention rate of students like that, it, it, it just gets really tough. Yeah. Um, and as somebody sense. who covers high school football in the state of Arizona, there's only three colleges that can recruit you to play football in Arizona. So people have to leave. So I'm used to having these conversations the other way around of somebody from Virginia came to get an Arizona and they're having to deal with like, my parents can't watch me play. I can't get home, but they don't have a lot of options. So they have to, they have to stick it out. Whereas if somebody from like where I'm at, I'm two hours from Wake Forest, NC state, North Carolina, Duke, Furman, Gardner Webb, University of South Carolina, Clemson, Queens University. Um, I am next to uh, Wingate. I'm right next to Wingate. Um, University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Yep. I'm an hour and a half from UNC Asheville. Uh, the little schools like Mars Hill University, like D2s, D3, they all have football here. Every single one of them has football here. There's a JUCO scene. Um, like they could yeah. come be closer to home and only be two hours away at any one of 30 colleges. Right. So, it, you know, it, it, it just it it'll be interesting to see if Arizona State is tempted now that they're going to travel to Ohio, now that they're going to travel uh, to Florida, if if that opens them up to recruit those areas successfully. Yeah, I do like their current strategy because I saw the other yesterday that Dillingham's on the road and I think it was like Texas and Louisiana. And I love yeah. that Texas, obviously, you should use yeah. Texas no matter what conference you're in if you're ASU, but it, even more so now. Louisiana, I love that, too, because it's it it's far it, it, like it's not that far away from Arizona compared to like Georgia or, you know, yeah. like and they've had guys from Louisiana before, too. So. Great play. We have the, the Jordan Clark right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good too. So yeah. Um, Colton, you want to add anything in before we wrap this up? No, nah, man. I think this was a really, really fun conversation and I'm glad you, you got on with us, Ralph. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me. I, I love talking to ASU. I like talking with you guys and I like your hat. Hey, thank you. NLCS, my friend. Can't believe it. Uh, they, me neither. It's, it's surreal. Yeah. It's surreal. I gotta, I gotta, little noise complaint last night from my downstairs <laughs> my downstairs neighbor but you know it, it's how it goes when you hit four home runs in one inning i can't be expected to remain on the ground yeah you know what just get him a um grab him some uh some candy some yeah gas. i'll figure it out i'll i'll, I'll do something <laughs> yeah just let, oh. just let, just let him know no no harm no foul uh never happened before in history so unless they do it again they probably shouldn't have to worry about. Yeah, uh, I got to be careful for the CS. I, I yeah. know that now, but. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's crazy. But like, <laughs> they're here, especially with some of the depths they reached during the season of just looking yeah, terrible. Yeah, DFAing, DFAing, DFAing two of your five starting pitchers to open the season and making <laughs> it to the NLD. NLC. It reminds me. I went to an Appalachian State game on Tuesday. They played mm-hmm. Coastal nice. Carolina out here. Um, two hours from App State, by the way. So I went to an Appalachian State uh, versus Coastal Carolina game on Tuesday. On the way, drove through Madison Bumgarner's hometown. And the, as you get into town, that's all. It's just home of Madison Bumgarner. And we were up wow. 2-0 at the time. So when I saw that sign, I was like, huh. That's, that's very ironic, given the timing. Yes. <laughs> I, I completely forgot that Madison Bumgarner was on. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. time this year. Wow. Yeah, because he was back. Zach he Davies, was man. Back. Zach Davies. Yeah. Well, hey, Ralph, anytime you want to go for the hat trick of recurring guests, um, you just let us know, man. We'd, we'd be happy to have you on a third time if you want to come back. Hey, anytime. Just let me know. Yeah, cool. maybe like uh... – what a, like not after the season, but maybe post uh, transfer portal shuffling. <laughs> oh yeah, that'll be fun. That'll yeah. be fun. Um, maybe something like that after ASU picks off Jaden Delora five times in the Territorial Cup. I just 
I really hope Jed Fish just keeps starting Jaden Delora, man. Like, he, Fafita is so much better. It's so I, I co host a show called Pac 12 Apostles, and we were talking yeah. today, like, about how Jaden Delora at his best probably gives you the best chance to win. But anytime there's an opportunity for an emotional game, um, he turns into maybe the worst quarterback of all time. And I cannot imagine a more emotional game than this week. I can't. They're going to Pullman. That's oh. where he came from. And he was he terrible. Uh, game last hates. Year. Yes. He was terrible last year. So this is maybe his last chance. He hates them. They he hate him. Nothing. Yeah. And it's going to be, and it's going to be there. And I just know that he's going to try. First of all, if Jed, if Jed, if Jed Fish is telling the truth, and and J, and and um, Jaden Delora, if he said if he's a hundred percent, he'll play. If I'm Jaden Delora and you put that like out there like that, I'm lying. I'm just like I'm a hundred and fifty percent actually. Actually, I wasn't. I've ne- I haven't been hurt at all. You you know you sat me for no reason. I'm so healthy <laughs> because if you're really putting it on me to go and play against my former team, I'm going to play. So right. I'm, I'm very fat. I, I'm going to be glued to that game, just glued to it because uh, either we're going to see Noah Fafita play a third game. And if he plays a third game, I don't think he's ever given that job back or we are going to witness one of the more underratedly contentious matchups in yeah. the entire country, yeah, uh, which will probably be on like Pac-12 Network. Yeah, I was just about to look because I'm like, Wazoo to cover might be my my best bet of the day, but I don't know if we're gonna get if we're gonna get any broadcast of that one. Yeah, it. <laughs> I just like just watching Fafita. I'm like, like he's not like probably gonna win a Heisman or anything, but he's just clearly like the operate the offense just works better with him and Manning it and. <laughs> he went so fun. No, if I don't back. get the the Laura uh, loyalty from Fish, I just don't get it. Yeah. And that's not even talking about the off the field stuff. Like, right. <laughs> so fun fact on Noah Fafita, he went to high school with with uh, Ted Arroyo McMillan. Right. Yeah. So he he made his bones in high school throwing to the star, and now he has two of them. Right. Arguably three, Tanner McLaughlin can play. Yeah, he's a good tight end, yeah. So, like, he he will just give it to the best player. He will go out, he'll, Taylor Kelly, it. like, sure, I'll just back shoulder throw to Jalen Strong to get us out of this third and 11 jam. Like, he, he, will, he will just, he won't go try to force the issue. He will just throw it to the best player on the team over and over, which is how Jacob Cowan got four touchdowns against right. USC, by the way. And that is such an awesome recipe for success. I love it when it's just simplified of, like, Oh, you just give your best player the ball over and over and over yeah. again. Um, like Joe Burrow and Chase last week. Yes, like, yes, yes. And I hope ASU gets to that point with with uh, everybody being healthy enough to just dump the ball off to to you know Badger Conyers and and Scadaboo. Just those three yeah. over and over and over again would be great. Yeah, definitely. I'm with All you. All right. Guys. Well, Ralph, thanks for coming on. Um, it's been great talking with you and just uh, just kind of just talking through a bunch of ASU uh, issues there. Yeah, this was this was therapeutic fun, for Mark. I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just no, it's just like it, you, you just I don't know. For some reason, I'm just like I've as I've left the school, I've like been a more passionate fan like every year. <laughs> and it's like it's just it's like why why is why is this period of ASU football like intersecting with like like this time in my life? It's like yeah, whatever. It is what it is, I guess. But uh, when I so the four four or five years that I spent as the as a beat reporter and recruiting reporter for ASU, that's what like I was like. All right, my full time job is to think about what would make ASU, you know, wh- where where are expectations and reality not lining up, and how do we bridge those gaps? And is all I thought about. And then, you know, 2019, 2020, I get to go back to being a fan again. But that way of thinking didn't go away. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm just like, that's all I think about. But also I'm pissed off. <laughs> and I get to yeah, say they, they like pops blended into my head. together. Yeah. yeah. They like, they like yeah. mesh. It's like and I'm not Bruce sure. Banner's Hulk full time, you know. <laughs> I'm angry all the time. But <laughs> I, uh, yeah. So I, I think it's what's weird is I think that some people look at me and they're like, oh, is he still 
and ASU reported like absolutely not in no way right do I have, yeah like, any press responsibilities as far as ASU you know but a, a few of the people that followed me like that's how they came so whenever I'm talking about ASU I think they take it as like oh wow this guy just kind of says whatever he wants like no I, I it's because there's no consequences for me half the stuff that I that you know that I say if I was in that capacity I would get in trouble for Right. Of course. Like, yeah. I would, and I would hurt, I would definitely hurt my own ability to have access to, to the program um, with the way that I talk. So it is nice not having that, but still covering high school football and the PAC 12 in general. So I do have to stay informed and I do talk to a lot of the, the, the kids that are being recruited still. Um, and so it does give me a little more information, but I'm not trying to scoop anybody. I'm not trying to like be a, be a reporter or anything like that. I just really want ASU to win. Um, because I still owe them money for my bachelor's degree. <laughs> I don't want to feel like I'm making uh, these payments for a reason. Right. Yeah. Listen to that, Michael Crow. I hope if you're watching this, <laughs> you I'm are. sure he is. Hey, yeah. If, I, I yeah, but I mean, I if Joe Biden cancels this the, these student loans, I might just go back to being a Wyoming fan. So do something they are, to, to they are a better football team today than asu is that's for sure unfortunately i hope it's not the case next year when asu plays them because i don't like playing good group of five teams in the non-conference i just don't there's no gonna, there's no upside yeah i'm gonna fly out for that game and i'm guarantee you i'm gonna be miserable the whole time there's no upside whatsoever yeah. no matter what happens i lose because well, Wyoming's going to make it an ugly game too, because that's just what they do, and like they so don't that, know any other way. Yeah, they did it to Texas this year; they can do it to us. So, um, all right. Well, please like and subscribe. Please rate and review on your podcast app of choice. And as always, go Devils. <laughs>